I was on my knees. It was one of the most shattering jobs I've ever done. If you give the clear on the doors when they're not shut and the automation press go, the whole thing just goes. I think London has one of the most incredible theatre scenes. I defy anyone not to be excited. To build a show from the beginning is amazing and to be part of that. To walk into a room where you have no idea what's going to happen and six weeks later you've got a show, that's incredible. Today we're talking to Lorna Cobbold, a company stage manager with nearly three decades of experience in the performing arts. Lorna has worked at every major theatre you can possibly name and all around the world and worked with some amazing people. I mean, we're there for the audience and that's what we're doing. We're telling a story for people. I mean, if it wasn't for the audience, I mean, we might as well go home. If you can ever get to a sits probe, if anybody can talk you into a sits probe, <laughs> just go to one. And by the interval, I was in tears. I mean, it was just heartbreaking. The atmosphere is set and that's what music does to you. And that's amazing. Hello and welcome to The Five Minute Call. This is a podcast where we take a deep dive into the stories of the people that make theatre happen. I think you'll really enjoy the conversation. We're all about people's stories and how they came to be in the position they're in, okay. in the theatre industry at the moment. Yeah. Would you tell us where you started your journey with theatre? I started, I didn't know what stage management was which is what i do do i need to tell you what i do yeah it's probably a good start yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. okay so yeah. uh i'm Hi, a I'm how are you <laughs> so i'm a company and stage manager and i went to a school that didn't do drama but you could do a bit of acting and i went and i directed a show um at school and it won a prize and That's i enjoyed bold. it just rewind over that what makes you you want to get up and direct straight away? Um, because at 17 you can do anything. <laughs> and it was, I went to one of those schools that had houses and there was an inter-house drama competition. Okay. And I was head of my house. And I think I was the only person in the sixth form in my house who'd even done any, I'd done, I did some Lambda acting. Fortunately, not many people have seen that, so that's good. Um, <laughs> but I did a bit of acting um, and somebody had to do it. And I it was amazing. I went off to Samuel French, which still existed back then, to find a play to do. And somebody there must have said there's a box under there for things to do with at school. And I found a Willie Russell play, um, which I should have remembered what it's called. And it was about... Um, a, a class and I think somebody done something wrong and they had a kind of jury or something um, and being very practical which has lent me into the next part of my job um, it was set in a school so we could wear school uniform and I could the set could be desks and as it was in a school I mean it was pretty basic as to be able to put it on and uh, the note I got at the end was upstage centre is more is better than downstage centre because uh, my lead was always front and centre. Um, I didn't know about the, you know, Laurence Olivier spot back then. Um, and I did that, and I think I enjoyed it. Um, and I wanted to go to art school, and I wanted to um, maybe be a designer. I quite like the idea of theatre design, but I more like the idea of art school, and that sounded... And to do a foundation, and so my friends were all at the art block and it was the nice place to be at school and my mum and dad said you should probably get a degree and then I thought okay well what am I going to get a degree in um I had no idea and I had a teacher who said why don't you do a drama degree and that sounded like a good idea I liked plays and I'd done a bit of acting and I'd done this um, and then I discovered to do a drama degree, you needed an English A-level, which I wasn't doing. So I swapped all my A-levels around and I did English in a year so I could do drama. Um, and I went to Manchester to read drama. And at Manchester, I met a man called Michael Holt. And Michael Holt is a, I say is, I hope still is. He's a designer and he designed for Alan Aitborn. Um, and he was one of my tutors. And I designed a show at uh, Manchester and it wasn't very good. Um, and he said, 
you'll never be a designer. Uh, but what you will be is a very good stage manager. And because you have a way of talking to actors and you have a way of under explaining ideas, um, but you don't have the imagination to be a designer. And I said, well, that sounds pretty great. But what is stage management? No idea at all. Um, and I carried on doing my degree and I thought I would become John Pilger. And I wanted to make documentaries that would change the world. Mm. And um, my first job out of university was in a PR firm and I absolutely loathed it. It was just hideous. So I left and went to sell ice creams and programmes at the Royal Court Theatre. And I was an usher there. And I said to Bo Barton, who was the production manager there, who I think went on to run Lambda or RADA, um, that I'd quite like to get into stage management. And she gave me a work placement upstairs at the Royal Court with a young director who was just starting out the Royal Court called Ian Rickson, who ridiculously I'm now doing a show with. Mm -hmm. uh, it was the first play of a new playwright called Joe Penhall. Um, it was called Some Voices. And it was my first sort of foray into um, theatre and I was the work experience. Before that, because back then to get a job, you needed an equity card because mm -hmm. I'm that old and you had to have 13 weeks to get a job. And Bo said, I can't give you a job because you don't have a card and you get into that catch 22. So before my work placement, I did the thing that everybody tells you to do. And I wrote 50 letters. There used to be a book called Contacts. Mm -hmm. And in it, somebody went through for me and ticked all the people who would have equity contracts. And I sent 50 letters. And there was a woman who ran a outdoor Shakespeare company back before everyone was doing it. And she said that she would give me an equity contract, but she wouldn't pay me. So I could get my leg on the ladder, my foot on the ladder, my leg on my foot on the ladder. Um, and I drove a van and I put speakers up outside and I took soaking wet costumes to the laundrette in poor, <laughs> where were we? Plymouth. We played outdoors in Plymouth. It was amazing. Um, we stayed in Cool Sand and the seawall, it was incredible, but it pissed with rain. And they were all in, what were we doing? Taming of the Shrew. Yeah. Um, and they were all in huge costumes and they all got soaking wet and I had to take them to the laundrette. Um, but I did sort of, <laughs> we went to the Isle of Wight, that was really cool. And Stourhead was quite creepy because I was there. And I got taught how to cable and I organised a few bits and pieces and I loaded a van. Mm. And then I went off to the Royal Court and I did this show for... Um, a stage manager who's called, and still is, Sheena Linden. And throughout my career, people I've met have looked after me and Sheena was the first person to sort of guide me through. And to this day, I still do a lot of things that she told me. Mm -hmm. um, and I did, so I was work experience on that. And then I got, I'd sort of done a few interviews. I wasn't, nothing really happening. Um, and the Nuffield which was still a producing rep theatre back then, um, <laughs> called and said, we need an ASM tomorrow. And I said, yes. And I got on a train and I moved to Southampton for three months and I learned my trade. I learned how to prop. Um, I learned what propping was. I learned what stage management was. I learned what paperwork was. Uh, I had brilliant people, um, friend to this day, um, an ASM with me who taught me or told me what I had to do, all the people around me, and I learnt. Um, and then after that, I got a job as an ASM in Chichester. We're doing the Hot House with Harold Pinter in it. Oh. And that took me to the comedy mm -hmm. theatre eventually after a mini tour. And weirdly, sitting here now, as I am at the comedy theatre, yeah. it's, uh, yeah, it's been quite a journey. That is, sounds an incredible journey. And I... I just wanted to go back and clarify some we have some young listeners yeah. who might not actually know what stage man management is. Oh, it's so give hard us, to explain. Oh, I know. So this is why give us the the cliff notes rundown of stage management. So what does stage management do? 
we make sure that everything is on stage ready to go for the performance so an act all an actor has to do is walk on stage and act and everything is there set up for them ready to go that starts in rehearsal so in rehearsal um first day of rehearsal you have a script hopefully <laughs> not all the time <laughs> but you have a script, <laughs> um, you go through the script and you write down all the props you think, props being glasses, um, anything that anybody might pick up, use, uh, furniture, and you get an idea of what you're gonna need for the show. You also have a model box, which the designer has put together, and you look at the model box, and if the script says it's set in a 14th century palazzo, and you look at the model box and it's set in a travel lodge, you know that, you've moved concepts mm. and you look at your props list and go, probably don't need the chandelier. And you look at the the model box and you write down everything that's in it. And you've then got an idea of what you need for the show. And then depending on where you're doing that show and what the budget is, you either then go and find all those things or you set, you work with a props buyer and your job then is for in the rehearsal room, if the props buyer's given you your restaurant in the travel lodge and the actor then in rehearsal says I think I'll be eating breakfast you then go to the props bar and say we're gonna it's gonna be breakfast so we need coffee jugs and we need this so you're kind of the conduit from what's happening in the rehearsal room into uh with the designer who'll tell you that the coffee mugs need to be this or and it's you're sort of part of a team of people making the physical production i think mm. that'd be a way of describing mm. so that's one side of it then the other side of it is your i suppose you're just supporting the actors in what they need to do in a practical way um i use the word practical an awful lot but i think we're the practical side of theater but uh, but i do think we also have an understanding of story and and why certain things are chosen or you might, depending on the how your rehearsal room is working, you might have an opportunity to offer up ideas of, do you think you'd have this at that point? Or would you have a notebook? Or what would that notebook be? And if you're doing something, I mean, I, start, I started having to prop. I, we didn't have prop buyers and I loved it. I'd go to markets, I'd research things. <laughs> I did a play once at the Old Vic with Michael Pennington and I was the only member of stage management and he was playing Chekhov and I went to a Russian library to find the right paperwork that Chekhov would have on his desk. You get to go to amazing places. Um, mm. Did a play about a lawyer uh, uh, who was an MP, so I went to Parliament and looked at lots of bits and pieces. Uh, I did a show at the Don Mark or Frost Nixon and one of the scenes was as an aeroplane and I went off to a salvage place in back of beyond and found some BA seats in an old burnt out aeroplane. That, <laughs> and that's what you did. And it was, was it was amazing fun. It was great. These days, somebody else gets to do most of that fun and you sit in a rehearsal room and just feed out and mm. feed in the ideas. And then I guess the other part of stage management is on the night of the play. Um, you set everything up. You have huge checklists to make sure everything's there. And once the curtain is up and the play is on, you might have what we call cues. So maybe an actor comes off um, and you hand them something or you shine a torch so they don't walk into a wall or you those sort of bits and pieces. And then there might be a scene change and you might go on in the pitch dark, which I'm doing at the moment, trying not to fall off the front of the stage, moving things around. <laughs> um, or it might be old school and you bring in this front cloth or something comes in and then you all dive on behind it and you move everything around um, and you change the scene. So that's sort of, it's that I think that's stage management. It's, yeah. I mean, if you tell us it's stage management, yeah. I'm going to believe you, Donna, <laughs> because cause you've done it quite a lot. So. Well, I think it's sort of, I mean, I've always made it up as I've gone along because I nobody's ever really told me what it was and I didn't spend, I didn't go to drama school and I didn't learn, I just learned on the job. And there's a lot of things I don't know. So um, I've had to pick it up yeah. and I've made some classic mistakes because I never got, I think a lot of stage management courses, you get a bit of technical stuff too. I mean, I thought a fairy light was a fairy light and I didn't understand why you needed an operator for fairy lights. 
and I've had people tell me that curtains are in you have curtains at home and you have drapes or I all my terminology and all of that I've just learnt and I'm not hugely technical um I don't know if that's something but I've but I've learnt what I need to know um and, and gone on from there just being quiet and watching and listening and seeing how it works um I think is huge one of the best one of my first ever jobs um was a it might have even been my first ever job I was an ASM on a an opera at the Queen Elizabeth Hall and I'd never done it before and I was just sort of trying to find my way through and it had a really smart the crew were from Glyndebourne so they were all over it they were brilliant and you learn from everybody and stage management and crew are like that one just has management in the title it's, it's the same kind of gig um, and he said to me the one thing he's how did he phrase it there's nothing wrong with please and thank you it was just such a simple thing because everybody is working together and if you think that word management in your title means that you're any better than that guy who's been doing it for you know can move this to career in 20 minutes and get it up and running no and it's just a really good leveller and I theatre is such a group of people all working together um, I thought that was that was just a great bit of early doors advice um, <laughs> and yeah I'm a watcher and a listener and I think particularly in so a rehearsal room has a very strange to learn how to be in a rehearsal room just takes sort of experience and listening and sitting and when to move and when to, I mean, it sounds ridiculous. Uh, there's only people pretending to be other people and telling stories, but there is a sort of um, way of not breaking a moment if somebody's, an actor's finding something or a director's on a roll or you, you don't want to be the person that breaks an idea or, um, and I think you learn a lot of that from just watching mm -hmm. and listening. You still enjoy the storytelling? Yeah, I do. Um, I've always been, I've always asked for a script before I take a job. I mean, unless it's Les Mis. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Cabaret or... <laughs> um, but new plays, I quite like to, I love being sent a script and, and seeing how we're going to do it. Have I ever turned down a job when I've read a script? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, I have turned down... Um, I was offered to, do, I mean, turning down work as a freelancer is insane. I mean, insane. Yeah. But um, there are things that just don't float your boat and you just know that you're not going to be very good at. And I think if you enjoy the story you're telling, you're better at your job. Yeah. And I remember going, being asked if I would take, oh God, I always forget its name. Send in the Clowns is the musical... Little night, night music. music. I was asked to do a little night music to bring it out of the chocolate factory and take it into the West End. And I said categorically, no, I'm not doing that. I went to see it at the National and everybody loved it at the National. And Judy Dench was singing and it was amazing. And I was like, this is awful. <laughs> oh, why am I here? <laughs> and I'd taken my mum and dad and it was going to be this huge thing. And we all sat there and went, oh, God, what is this? <laughs> so when I, I was asked to do it, I went, yeah, no, sorry, it's not my thing. Maybe I'm just one of those people who doesn't do Sondheim, I don't know. And the producer said, you've got to go and see it at the Chocolate Factory. Just go and see it, and then you can tell me you're not going to do it. So I went to see it. God, it was brilliant. It was <sighs> so good. And I took it into town, and I got my mum and dad to come and see it. And they're like, oh, no, it's that thing we saw at the National, isn't it? <laughs> no, no, you should just come, just come. And they talk about it to this day. It was great. And what do you put that down to? The two different, yeah, uh, different storytelling, mm -hmm. different interpretation of um, a piece. It's a different way of telling a story, and one that was you could understand it, I guess, or or actually hear the lyrics. I think is in, so important with some time, yeah. and maybe I hadn't heard the lyrics in the mm -hmm. original. Or I mean, it's hilarious. Some of that <laughs> musical. I mean, it's brilliant. You're clearly quite reverent about that, you know, listening to you talk about how to be in a rehearsal room, how 
Yes, I think I am, actually. Yeah, I think... <laughs> or I think I have respect for actors yeah. and performers. I think what they do is... And how they put themselves out there. Um, I don't to stand in front of all those people and pretend to be somebody else. Mm. I mean, for ent- for our entertainment or for our thoughts or... Um, I think it's amazing what they do. Um, so I think you should... I mean, an element of reverence. Let's not go crazy here. These, <laughs> no, they're not. They're not. Uh, and you like to think you might be. I think one of the art, the, are you changing the world? Well, you might be changing somebody's thought. You might be making somebody's happier, sadder. You might be giving somebody to think about something. I think you have to think of it like that. Um, but yes, I have. I have huge respect for what they do. So. At some point, and actually very quickly looking at your incredible resume here, it changes slightly from stage management to company management, but yeah. company stage management. Talk to us about um, that. When I remember meeting my first company manager as an ASM, and I thought, God, that is a terrible job. You wouldn't want to do that. <laughs> oh, I mean, here I am creating art and finding the right prop from the right era. This is what it's all about. And that, and they, and standing in a dinner jacket. I mean, company managers back then, dinner jacket, mm-hmm. wandering around showing people. And I just thought worrying about radiators and people's dressing rooms. I thought, was well, God, how dire. Um, I've been doing it for quite a long time. <laughs> <laughs> Still worry about radiators. It's part of radiators, cars. Yeah. Um, uh, I. So again, going back to people who don't know much about stage mm-hmm. management. There are three, maybe four members of a stage management team. You're an ASM. On a play, there's probably one of you. On a large musical, there might be four of you. There might be... I think there's a magic show that has nine. Um, So you're the nuts and bolts um, of making it happen. Then you have a deputy stage manager who I have such admiration for and awe for because I've done it and it's... I was terrible. It's just not my gig. Um, and the people who do that, and there are some killer DSMs out there, and uh, they are essentially the captain of the ship. So they sit and watch the show on a screen, multiple cameras, depending on what how big the show is and what's happening. They have the script in front of them. They have all the lighting cues, all the sound cues, uh, automation, whatever it is. And they literally press go on the show and run it the whole way through. The rest of us are in their hands. That's you might be the stage manager and technically above them, but the but the DSM in my view runs that ship for you on a nightly basis and you kind of dip in and out when you're needed and should it all go pear shaped, you dive in. Um and then you, and a the stage manager is weirdly, I guess in the hierarchy above that, and they keep an eye on everything. Um and they're usually eyes and ears by that point. And you're on the deck just making sure that everything is smooth, running smoothly. On a play, you're pretty much doing very little. On a large musical, you think of the great, huge shows with incredible stage managers who are watching. What's the show? Um, huge automated pieces, Lord of the Rings or something that these all these things move around and things are flying in. Um, I think the biggest show, I was an ASM on Showboat. It was one of my first ever big musicals. It was at the Prince Edward and it was a live event production. It come over from America and it was huge. And we had we had cars flying in and we had, well, we had the boat and then we had a street scene and the whole, th- I mean, it was vast. It was vast. I caused it to stop a couple of times, but that's another story. <laughs> um, so they keep an eye on all of that and they are, everybody feed the head of automation feeds into them and everybody feeds into them. Um, and then you get a company manager who worries about radiators and um, looks after, is the pastoral care, I guess, uh, but also generally does the payroll uh, and and is really the line between. It's a hard, it's quite hard because you are, you're the company's representative to the producer, but you're also the producer's representative mm-hmm. to the company. Mm-hmm. So you have to sort of find that middle ground where you're looking after both interests and but you're with the comp 
despite it being a slightly officey role, sort of it, uh, in America they do it differently. Over here, you are at the theatre whenever there's a show on. So you're the person that finds a plaster when that needs to happen or um, you you just try uh, and you look after actors, you look after the technical team, um, you, you you sort of, I guess, try and keep everything on track and, it, and everybody in a reasonably good place. Um, on a play, you combine the two roles of company and stage manager because there's not a huge amount of stage management to do often i tried to be a dsm because that's what you do after you mm -hmm. and i bought a flying piece in on michael gambon's head he was really polite about it um <laughs> but um he yeah he just sort of did bent down a bit um <laughs> he, he was an absolute delight i describe it as if you if you're a dsm you see in black and white and if you're a company manager company stage manager you see in gray so you you're a bit bigger picture whereas you've got to be completely um, it's either right or wrong. Is there a lot of pressure to that? To being a DSM? Yeah. Oh my God, it must be heinous. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine calling something like, I don't know, um, oh, in New York on Spider-Man, they had two DSMs, I think, because there was one person just couldn't call it all. Mm. Uh, what, well, Wicked, you must be calling people who are flying. Uh, Harry Potter, I mean, you have to learn both shows. I think that's massive. I think what, yeah, I mean, talk to, talk to a DSM, I don't know. Um, they might think it's just run of the mill in the way that, you know, if somebody else is doing a job, um, like a heart surgeon probably goes, oh, no, but it it's easy, but brain surgery, shit. It takes a different set of yeah. skills, skills, right? Yeah. And an ability not, not to be frightened that you're going to make a mistake, I would imagine, because as soon as you're frightened of that... It comes to it. I think they always say, just keep talking. Yeah. <laughs> if you're learning a book, which is learning to be a DSM, yeah. they just say, and everything's written down. So if it's all written down, you don't have to remember it, but you just have to keep talking. Mm. If you go, oh no, shit, I fuck that. Oh no, no quick, because it's just once that once you've opened, once the curtain is up, yeah. it is not going to stop. Mm. So th this is a sort of really interesting topic because from the audience perspective, you don't know when things are going wrong, and, yeah. and you shouldn't really know when things are going wrong unless they've gone really yeah. wrong. So we know sort of what a good show looks like, but what happens if something does go wrong? Well, I probably shouldn't admit this publicly, but I did cause Lion King to come to a grinding halt. Um, there is a, and it probably doesn't, it doesn't do this anymore. I was on Lion King just after it opened. So what are we talking, 30 years ago? 20, it's just had its something. Yeah. Um, and I went in as an ASM dep, and I'm sure this queue doesn't exist anymore. But in London, which I don't think it does on tour, the wildebeest come up through the floor. Mufasa gets trampled to death. Yeah. So there is a queue, isn't it? There used to be a queue. There are three lifts, and you'd you're dressed in black, so you're and you've got your headset on because you talk to everybody. And they put over a wildebeest sort of rug that goes over you, so that you can come up behind the wildebeest. You're coming up to the centre of the stage behind <laughs> the wildebeest as an ASM. And before you come up, you've got all, uh, your substage, so all the wildebeest load in. And then three doors have to close. And the queue used to be to give the clear to, so you give the clear to automation that all three doors are closed. Doors are closed, you're ready to move. You then come up behind the wildebeest and they're doing all their thing. And then you walk to the edge of the stage and you unhook a flying piece. Uh, it's a, a hookup for a foy flying. You then have to walk up these steps and come behind Simba hook him up, tap him to tell him he's hooked up, tell the DSM on your headset that you're clear and get off. I've had friends in and I said, it's so embarrassing that thing I have to do. And they go, what thing? You go, you know, when the wildebeest are doing the thing and the, with the, no, I didn't see you. What? But I, nobody sees yeah. you doing yeah. it. No. So you do that. If you give the clear on the doors when they're not shut, and the automation press go, the whole thing just goes <laughs> and the front cloth comes in. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm terribly sorry, we're having technical difficulties, just moving your seats. Is this hypothetical, Lorna? You're, you're talking like, about a hypothetical. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If Christ. that were to happen, were to happen, this happen. is what would happen. Good God, what, what's gone? What's happened? What's happened? Oh God, was it me? It's probably me. Oh fuck, it was me. <laughs> and once, yeah, it's, that shit happens. 
Sorry, I probably shouldn't say it like that. <laughs> no, it's okay. It's, it's yeah. honest. What, what's the recovery? Um, massive embarrassment. <laughs> um, and huge, just, I'm really sorry. I just, I thought it, people make mistakes. Yeah, yeah. Um, and there, with the big musicals and a lot, and big shows, your, your contingencies are so fast yeah. that, um, and we were up and running in two minutes. I mean, everyone goes, okay, shut, right, reload, right, let's do the doors, automation, take it in. Yeah, I'm good, everybody's set, right, we're going back to here, DSM, who is going, right, we'll go from here. So they tell the band, right, we're gonna go from this bar, they tell the lighting, we're gonna go from here, they tell sound, we're gonna go from here, they tell automation, we're gonna go from there. Everything's shut, bang, let's do it again. Okay, here we go, go. And it all starts. Yeah. And probably people will have noticed, but they will have forgotten by the end. Oh yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah. And again, depping on that show, I think it's one of the last places that has a lot. Pride Rock comes out at the end. Yeah. One one time I was doing it and it didn't happen. All the animals come on and it's a beautiful ending and oh, isn't the music great? I said to a friend, oh, it's just, you know, no Pride Rock. Like, what? Yeah. If you don't know if it's supposed to be it there, yeah. it's yeah. fine. Yeah. You, you can get away yeah, with yeah. quite a lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so having That's told it. us that company manager appeared to be the most boring job in the world you nonetheless have done it for an awfully long it. time yeah. it's very rare that i'm just a company manager mm -hmm. um i've done that twice to build a show from the beginning is amazing and to be part of that yeah to walk into a room where you have no idea what's going to happen and six weeks later you've got a show that's incredible and to be part of that and as a company manager you are keep your feeding everything in and you're getting people to talk to each other which is a sort of element of the stage manager in it and then when the show is up and running yeah see i'm rarely just a company manager so i've sort of on the deck and i hear i hear it and i see it and i like to walk out into the audience and at the beginning um, and get an idea of are people excited what's it feel like out there in the interval all that kind of stuff um, I think you're just part of this amazing machine. It took quite a few years before you moved from plays into musical theatre. Yes. But then you've done a lot of musical theatre. Yes. Um, could you talk to us about the differences between the two? One's better paid. <laughs> 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 um, which was my initial move into musical theatre. Okay. Um, uh, I had a lovely time putting on plays and they were great. I was skint. <laughs> um, and the reason they pay more is because they're much harder um, there are more people involved well uh, generally unless you're doing a sort of boutique musical yeah. um, but there are you also have to look after so one of the things a company manager does is schedule mm -hmm. um, I quite like it it's about sort of tet time Tetris and who can do what when and you've got to so on a musical, the company manager probably spends most of their time trying to plan the next day because you have got wig fittings, uh, costume fittings, somebody's being measured, a vocal coach is coming in, um, you need dialect maybe, uh, there might be a fight. Um, the range of people who are involved, more often than not in a musical, is pretty vast. So for every scene, there is a song and for every song there's probably a number a dance so that's three disciplines that have to happen for one scene so it's busier um it takes more more organization you've got three directors you have to look after there's generally more people in it um and then you throw once you've done all of that then you throw in a band as well on top of that um and i'm not very musical so it was a quite a learning curve for me to learn about bands and MDs and so I and to learn orchestration that was astonishing I mean I have been incredibly fortunate to be in a room with Bill Brown mm. and Bill Brown was oh he was just this incredible man who made movement music into movement movement into music yeah um yeah. and I've watched him watch a rehearsal of an actor, um, I think it was Barnum, doing a number, and then he went away and put that that, that actor's movements into music. Uh. I mean, you the hairs on the back of your neck. I mean, it was incredible to watch him work. Um, 
watch him, listen to him work. And he was a really nice man. Um, so to un and what I've enjoyed about musicals is learning more and more about the music. I still don't know very much and I still rely heavily on a DSM who, if they're on a musical, can probably read music. And I can hear if a, if the band's going a bit off, but they're, the DSM will go, oh, that thing with the third bar with the yada yada. I'll be like, okay. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> All right, yeah I didn't really notice that. One. Okay. But I can hear, you know, a, a flat tuba. Um, and yeah, they're just bigger generally because there are more people involved because there are more disciplines involved and do you find that exciting uh yes and no um do i find yes i do well i kind of like to do both i'm just greedy that way um i love being in a room that's just all about words and then uh we did a sing th- um we did a sing through for cabaret at the end of i guess first two weeks and you're in a room with all these actors, just with a piano, and they sing through the whole play. And by the interval, I was in tears. I mean, it was just heartbreaking. Um, and that's what music does to you. And that's amazing. Um, a sits probe, if you can ever get to a sits probe, if mm. anybody can talk mm. you into a sits probe, <laughs> just go to one. So for our listeners, a sits probe, If you're rehearsing a musical, you generally only rehearse it with a piano in the room. Depending on what type of musical, you might have um, a percussionist who gives you rhythm. Uh, uh, All the choreographers want you to have a... But I've done a lot where it's just a piano. But in the back of your mind, there's a 20-piece orchestra. Mm. Or there's a 10... Whoever they are. However big it is. And the, the sits probe is the first time you take all your actors into a room and they meet the band for the first time and they listen to the to the show for the first time and the actors are blown away by the artistry of the of the band the band have had their own rehearsals and then again if you go back to orchestration and you see an actor if you're lucky enough to work on a musical that's being orchestrated while you work on it you see an actor listen to their movement and that's their face just explodes They're like oh my god or there is a uh, an, an ident of something in a in the way that a character said something and they've put it into the music, and it's just I mean it's incredible. It's a a, a rare moment. I've cried like a baby in quite a lot of them. I was very tired in one of them, but <laughs> I do remember the Les Mis O2 sits probe that was vast. Were you there for that? Twenty fifth anniversary. Twenty fifth anniversary. We did the. It was the three companies at the O2 mm-hmm. and we were at three mills doing a sits probe and I was on my knees. It was one of the most shattering jobs I've ever done. And, but you always try and get to the sits probe because mm-hmm. it's the best thing about a musical. And at the end they did the full Valjeans mm-hmm. um, for the first time. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, but other times you're just like, some, mm-hmm. you just want to get up and dance. I mean, it's amazing. And that I think is the brilliance of a musical. It's just watching it all come together. That one's filmed as well, so... It's probably me should... in the corner weeping. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. People should go and check it out if they... Uh, oh, well, they videoed the set. Yeah, it's videoed. Yeah, it's, videoed. Oh, okay. it's on the, um, I think, special edition of, okay. the, of the DVD release that you yeah. get on YouTube. Yeah. Um, I think yeah, I'm on that DVD. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I like doing both. But one, generally you have to sign up longer for a musical because they run longer. The other thing about them is that you often can't company stage manage a musical because there's too much happening on the deck. Um, and I'm sort of been lucky with the, the times that I have company managed only. Have I been lucky? Some I've been lucky with. There have been other things that have kept me interested. So Les Mis in Australia, Australia kept me interested. <laughs> if you see what I mean, and moving yeah. around. Yeah. Um, but I, yeah, I what I really like is a new musical in a small space. Mm. They're the ones that I find very exciting. I wondered if you feel like there's a, um, there's opportunity for you to develop your own style as a stage manager or a company manager or a company stage manager? Yes, I think there, there's definitely a way of having your own style. Yes. Um, 
I mean, the, a stage manager's job is a stage manager's job, but there is a way and a means of doing that. Mm. Um, and there's a way and a mean, as in any job, of running a team and being a manager. Um, and you can do that very different ways. Um, so, yes, I think it's absolutely open to who you are and how you want to deal with it. Um, and you can bring your own way of managing people or running things. And was there a moment during your career where you became aware of your own style? No, I have no idea how people perceive me. I really don't. I mean, they do occasionally say, oh, well, yeah, you're not on the fence about that one, are you? I'm quite honest. <laughs> um, and I'm quite vocal, I suppose. Um, and if people are being kind, they say, oh, great job, thank you, or you did that really well, or... So you, but I, I don't really know what I try and do if I'm running a tech, which I really enjoy. Do I need to explain that for the listener? Yeah. No, yeah. <laughs> I was going to say no on oh, that okay. one. That no. one but... <laughs> um, so we've gone from the rehearsal room, we've had a sits probe, uh, or we haven't if it's a play, and the tech is the first time the actors stand on the physical set and the lighting designer and the sound designer and all the video people or whoever it is get to make the show together. And the person who runs that tech in this country is the stage manager. And it's your responsibility with the DSM to gather all the information that the DSM needs to run the show. Um, so they're essentially doing most of the work, but you're the one on stage moving it along uh, waiting, the lighting designer will be lighting a scene. You just want to go on to the next scene. You just need to get through it. But it's a way of managing an awful lot of people and time and the actors who get really bored because it's not about them. Um, and to put the physical elements together. So if I run a tech, I, I try and keep it reasonably jolly. I use the word jolly a lot, but it's, you know, we're lighting it can be quite boring for everybody. It can be frustrating. Um, you're wait sometimes you're waiting for really technical programming to happen. You can we change it by a millimeter? Can it come in a bit less? Can it go out a bit more? It's not working. Why isn't it working? Can we do that on that different beat? I'm gonna have to add some it it's that sort of recipe melting pot thing that can be a bit so you just need to keep an energy in the room, I suppose. Yeah. Um I think I try and do that. I think I do have a style, but I'm not sure I could explain it to you. I think somebody mm. else would have to. Mm. So you're sort of I think natural just by the way you do things. I think some of it, I've been doing it a long time. Mm. I think the brilliance of being an ASM, and I was an ASM for a long time, is that you watch a stage manager. So but once you become a DSM, you're the only DSM on a show. So mm. how do you learn what other DSMs mm. do? So when people are really desperate to stop being ASMs, I say, listen, just use it to learn what other people do and see their skills. And I've had some great stage managers and I've had some great people to watch and I've had some incredible company managers um, and I've learned from them. Um, and I think that's really important. I certainly think you have a style having worked <laughs> with you. <laughs> Hopefully it's and a it's a one. rather magical combination of extreme efficiency and practicality and a bucket of heart and instinct. I think your instinct, certainly when we've worked together with performers to support them, your instinct, you say you don't know anything about music, but actually your instinct about the singer is superb. Thank you. And I think that certainly watching from my viewpoint of it is is a really unique style that's great there's not very many people who have that i think you also learn don't you to how you watch people do what they do mm. um and i would say probably if you talk to the company my first ever musical theater company when we met mm. um les mis, les mis 25th tour. anniversary yeah. tour and you spoke to them and then you spoke to let's say the company of rock follies from this summer or cabaret they might have completely different ideas because yeah. it's, what, 20 years later. I think I have listened to people like you. I've listened to musical directors. 
Um, I've listened to musicians. I've listened to singers. Um, and I learn something on every job. Um, and so I guess instinct and learning come together mm -hmm. a bit, I think. Um, and you also grow in confidence as you get older in expressing what or talking to people and asking why and how. And then again, experience, you see how some roles affect people. So if it affects that person doing that role, maybe in this musical, that is also a thing. Um, yeah. Um, and I and I hope I bring a slight element of humour to it. As well. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise it all sounds frightfully earnest and a bit dull. <laughs> but maybe not. Maybe I just think I'm funny. No. Mm. But yeah, I think if you're, if you've got somebody who is, I suppose that's the other thing, the, the other big difference is that an actor doesn't have to sing. So an actor might lo lose their voice or get ill or have a chest infection or, but there is more often a way of fighting through that. When a singer loses their voice, they feel like they're losing their very being. And trying to put that person back together mm -hmm. um, and remind them, well, I always say, it's like you've twisted your ankle. It's just, it's a, you haven't lost your raison d'etre. And mm -hmm. sometimes you just have to put ice on it and put your foot up and you're doing the same thing. But it's taken a long time to be able to be able to say that to somebody yeah. or, or, or to consider that might be helpful or... And yeah, I think that's the experience. But you just, you talk to a lot of people and they, you just learn a bit every day. What's next? Yeah. If you're allowed what's to talk about it. Uh, what's next for me? Um, so I am going back to the musical world. I've just spent, or I am now on a play. Another great part of my job um, is I get to work on new writing. And this year I've done three new things. Um, two plays in a musical um again hugely lucky to be able to fit in a musical in a year um between so um so i'm now doing a play new writing loving it great team of people and then at the end of january i fly to new york to help put on cabaret on broadway Amazing. it's pretty exciting how's that feel it's pretty <laughs> exciting i mean i'm hugely lucky in that i've put on a show in new york before but it in brooklyn um and it's a very different style and way of doing things and i think but they were used to english companies being there but i think to be in a, a west um sorry a broadway house on broadway will be i think it, it'll be fascinating because they do things so differently um and i'm always i think london is has one of the most incredible theater scenes and the amount of new stuff we do or the old shows that still keep running and are still good to see. And um, I, th I think we're so lucky, national. Um, and I don't know enough about American theatre, but so it, it, it will be amazing to be out there and see what's there and what's on. And mm. probably won't be able to see any of it because I'll be working. But yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but and how they do things very differently. Um, and you don't find that intimidating? No, I probably I probably find it irritating more than intimidating. <laughs> um, having worked with some American companies who've come here, um, we work much quicker. We're way more on the fly here. Um, we're not so unionized, so we can cross pollinate with different mm -hmm. departments doing different things. Um, so it all moves at a, quite a great rate, which mm -hmm. I, I'm told in America everything is a lot slower. Okay. Um, and there is less cross departmental there is no cross departmental um, and different people do different things so I think it will be interesting to see mm. something like cabaret just mm. requires this mixture of front of house people yeah. doing a bit of this and then the cast doing a bit of that and then there's the prologue and then there's the back and it, mm. it's all I mean, it's this great kind of world of different people doing their thing to make one thing brilliant mm. and i wonder 
it'll be interesting to see how we can do that in America. Are you preparing a mental strategy for that? No, I'm buying thermals. Um, <laughs> uh, am I provide? No, I think you just have to... Well, you can't do it like you want to do it. Yeah. I mean, that's with anything, isn't it? I mm. mean, if you're going to, to arrive and go, well, you should do it like this. Yeah. I mean, we did it like this. I mean, why are you doing it like this? Yeah. Um, to anything in any job when you're taking something over or putting on... So I think you just have to go with, this is sort of what we're aiming for. Mm -hmm. How do we get there? Mm. Um, and this is what we're trying to achieve and this is what's exciting about it. This is what we hope you'll find exciting about it. Um, and just, I think it, and you just have to be patient and see how other people do things. I mean, I've, again, been incredibly lucky and put on shows in Japan and Brazil and you just, just need to be there as a, you're just trying to get to the right place, I think. Mm -hmm and just get the strands together, I suppose. First of all, yeah. thank you so very much for no being worries. here. This has been really amazing, really insightful, I think, to a lot of people, and just another aspect of the industry that is that we, that we can shed light on, which yeah. I think is really cool. Right. We have a couple of traditions. Oh, we would very much like to know what your five-minute call routine is. What do you do at your, at your five-minute call? <laughs> I suspect... <laughs> I think I think we know the answer. Yeah. But... <laughs> in the five. Yeah. Um well by then I've pro so as a company manager I go around every dressing room. Um to say hello. Most people I will have seen if there's a group warm up. But uh so during the half and I I suppose actually this isn't an answer because I try and get it done by the five, but I make sure I see everybody every day. Um even if it's, hey, how are you doing? Generally, people will go, I'll always ask, are you under control? Um, <laughs> it's just my thing. Um, and I will do that. And that's when you catch up with people that you might not have seen, see how their day is, that kind of. So that's generally my half. By the five, again, depending on if I'm a stage manager or not, I'm probably putting on black clothes. I'm finding a headset, mm. wondering if the batteries run out. At the moment, I have to put on two headsets because one is for the front of house. So I'm balancing that. Um, and then I forget to put my torch on. Um, so I get kitted up. I wear a torch around my neck and two headsets. So you get in your Batman suit. Of I get gear. into my, <laughs> and then I'm ready to go. And if I'm covering a plot, I look for a bit of paper that has my cues on it. Um, and then I try and remember what I'm going to do. And then I head out. If I'm a company manager uh, in the five, I'm often out front because I like to see the audience come in um, and what? see the house filling up. What? And well, you just hear the sort of buzz and people occasionally say things. And you think, yeah, OK, that's good. Um, <laughs> or I just I don't know. Otherwise, I could be in, doing performance art. I mean, we're there for the audience. Yeah. I mean, that's what we're doing. We're telling a story for people. I mean, if it wasn't for the audience, I mean, we might as well go home. Um, so it's quite nice to be amongst them. And sometimes I come back and go, oh, yeah, I think they're really buzzing tonight. Or Because, again, for the actors, um, we have a show relay. So you can hear what's happening on stage in your dressing room. And some theatres just leave it switched off until the show starts. But you'll have some actors who will always say, can we have it on the half? Because then you can hear the house fill up. Mm. Um, and you can hear that. That's the best thing about Cabaret when we first um, started. It was quite close to COVID. And downstairs at Cabaret has tables. And very cunningly, you can hear the tinkle of glassware and the eye and of a restaurant and Nick Lidster, genius. But you walk in and there's these twinkling lights and you cannot, I defy anyone not to be excited. It's just the atmosphere is set. Yeah, it is very exciting. And it's just, it's a beautiful bit of theatre even before you've got to the theatre. Mm. Um, so yes, in the five, might be out front, probably getting ready for the show, um, hopefully not dealing with some heinous disaster that has just materialised and <laughs> the lighting board's gone down, somebody's mm. twisted their ankle, they can't find their costume, hopefully not doing any of that. <laughs> Very cool. Yeah. 
So one of the other things that we do on this podcast is we get the guest previous to write a question. Yeah. For the current guest. Yeah. And it is completely unknown to all of us. Is there a specific reason that you decided to make musical theatre your career? And do you think it's been a good choice? Um, to quantify, I haven't made musical no. theatre my career no. choice because that would be a disaster for me. <laughs> um, do I, so I will just, do I think choosing a life backstage in theatre has been a good career choice? Um, there are, I think like any career, well, I think it's not a, does it say career or does yeah. it say? Uh, yes. So I don't think what we do is a career. I think it's a life choice. Mm -hmm. um, because it's very hard to switch off. You don't really do it between certain hours. Um, well, you can, but not if you're being a company manager. Um, I've only recently, well, quite recently learned that you can put do not disturb on your phone at night. It's brilliant. Yeah. And I think if you are making those that life choice, um, you you only get one day off a week and particularly if you're in musical theatre but you in musical theatre you can book holidays that's what a long running show does um you're freelance you never quite know what's going to happen next you're only as good as your last job um i'm thinking i just sort of um you're going to miss the odd wedding um as you but i think it's changing i think in the years that i'm doing this i think it's changing and you can put life a bit more into the job. Um, I must really enjoy it because I'm still doing it. <laughs> and I think the, the the big, I'll also say that everybody I know in stage management sits around and works out how to get out of it. That's the thing. You put a bunch of company managers in a room with a glass of wine, they all try and tell you how they're going to stop doing exit, it, what their exit strategy, strategy is. <laughs> and yet they're all still there planning it. Um, oh, God, that's so hard. That's what justifying your life on a Monday afternoon. I, know. I can't I know. do that. We've had, some, we've had some really, really hard hitting questions. Yeah, I just, so I'm not sure I'm, I can do that. That's, that's okay. That's also a uh, I've had some answer. really great times. I've met yeah. some really great people. Yeah. I've put on some fantastic shows. I've traveled the world. Um, I'm solvent. Um, and I'm still doing it. On balance. On balance, I'd say it was probably a good idea. Pretty good. Also, I have no so. no other idea of what I would have done otherwise. <laughs> but I again, also for anybody out there who's going to get into this, you make one choice, just to try, and then you'll get another choice. Mm -hmm. There's no fixed way of doing this. Mm -hmm. Something will come, and if you want to do it, do it. If you think you can do it, do it. If you think you can't do it, have a go. Uh, but it just comes at you. If you realise you don't like it, then just stop doing it because it can be really hard. Fantastic I advice. Really I think. good advice. Brilliant. Thank you so much. No worries. Thank you. Well, good. I'm going to give you the book. But you God, can I'm going to come up with a off, real yeah. off corker yeah, for on, some person. Yeah, give us a real Yeah, it's bang. Monday afternoon. Justify yourself. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching our episode today. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe so that you won't miss an episode in the future. If you currently are or have been affected by any of the topics discussed in this episode, please see the show notes below for some helpful resources.